Amos Clark wrote the hymn, Hark the Children Sweetly Sing, and used the phrase, Children of the Latter Day, he was probably rejoicing about the restoration of the gospel. Today, however, we as his descendants use that same phrase because we are his family living in the latter day. It is important for us to know the story of the lives of Amos and Ann Clark. They are the roots from which we come. What would they want us to know about them? What would we want them to know about us as their descendants? These are the questions that are answered only by each individual descendant of Amos and Ann Clark. The story began in Wales. Most historians remember 1536 as the year that King Henry VIII made his break from Rome and established the Church of England. But any Welshman will tell you the truly important thing that happened in 1536 was the Act of Union. Under the Act of Union in 1536, Wales was politically united with England, and further use of the Welsh language was forbidden. Only English was spoken. However, the English were not able to figure out a way to keep the Welsh from speaking Welsh, so the language has continued in use to the present day. Even though Rose is located only nine miles from the English border and surrounded by English-speaking villages, Welsh is still spoken as the community language. In the ancestry of Amos Clark, there are marriages across the border and some of his ancestors are English. Amos and Anne came from the northeast of Wales. Roslana Grigog is a village in the county borough of Wrexham in northeast Wales. Roslana Grigog means more of the heathery glade. It is often known simply as Ros. The Amos family lived in a suburb of Ros known as Ponky Banks. The development of the village may largely be attributed to the coal seams of northeast Wales that pass beneath the village. A large mining community was established there during the 18th century. Many inhabitants worked long hours in dirty, dangerous conditions in the coal mines. Amos went down in the Havard coal mines quite often to shoe horses. One time when he was returning to the hoist, some mine timbers fell on the little tram car in which he was riding and he received an injury to his back which made it very difficult for him to shoe horses after that. This is a picture of the house that Amos was born in. It was one of three buildings owned by the Clark family. Their home was small but similar in size and furnishings with other homes of families of moderate means. Notice the thatch roof and the whitewashed walls are made of adobe brick. The adobe brick was made of mud and straw. Amos's father, Edward Clark, and his grandfather, Samuel, were blacksmiths. Edward Clark was a master blacksmith, knowing and teaching many different arts of the trade of ironwork and carriage and coach building that other men of the same trade were unable to do. Later in life, he was a coach builder. Amos had the opportunity to help his father in the blacksmith shop and to learn that trade. He followed it until he became an expert in the forging of iron and the tempering of steel. Due to their skill and craft, the Clark family was well established and lived comfortably in the community. Amos worked as a blacksmith for 13 years before he immigrated to America. Edward's home was located at Clark Street. Amos's father, Edward, was married twice. With his first wife, Margaret Hughes, he had six children. Three of them died as babies. One daughter, Miriam, joined the church and immigrated in 1861, before Amos and Anne immigrated. Miriam didn't have any children. Edward's and Margaret's son, Moses, was killed as a young man at Kevin Viaduct in 1848. Edward wrote this article to the British Millennial Harbinger in 1849. My eldest son, Moses Clark, who was a very promising youth, went out one evening of his 25th year, leaving my residence for a day, and was killed by a crane belonging to a railway company. He had a very large congregation on the day of his funeral. Edward's first wife, Margaret Hughes, died in 1831. Edward then married Ann Jarvis in 1832. Together, they had eight children. Amos was the oldest of Edward and Anne's children, and felt the responsibility of helping the family, as did the other children. The second child was Samuel, 
We do not know much about Samuel, but it may have been that he was an invalid. The third child was Hannah. She did not marry, but was described by her niece as a frail but gentle person. In the 1871 census, she was working as a servant in the home of George and Ann Wally, but in the 1881 census, she was living at home in Ross with her mother Anne, who was then 74 years old. The fourth child of Edward and Anne was Dinah. She married Samuel Perry. They did not have any children. Before she was married, Dinah worked as a laundry maid and housemaid. She was older than her husband. Her husband, Samuel Perry, worked as a bricklayer. The fifth child was Mary. She married William Davis. They had two children. Her husband worked as an engine driver. Edward and Anne's sixth child was Naomi. Before she was married, she worked as a laundress in the home of Conwy, who was a magistrate in a nearby town. In 1881, Naomi was living at home with her mother and her sister Hannah. Her future husband, Andrew Williams, was a boarder at the home of her brother, Edward Clark, Jr., in 1881, and in 1882 they were married. They had two children. Their children were Grenville and Mary Orpa. Andrew Williams was a carpenter. The seventh child of Edward and Ann Jarvis was Edward Clark. In just a moment, we will take a closer look at Edward's family, because it is through the family of Edward that we have had contact with Wales through the years. Edward Clark and Ann Jarvis's eighth child was Lemuel Clark. We don't know much about him, except that he died at 48 years old. Returning to Edward Clark, Jr., this younger brother of Amos was one of the pioneers of the famous Penakai Choir and also conducted the Ross United Choral Union. He also managed the business E. Clark's Son Undertakers. Edward married Sarah Platt. They had seven children, Henry, Hannah, Priscilla, Samuel, Lemuel, Edith, and Bertha Clark. Edith is the third child of Edward. She is a niece to Amos Clark. Her son later managed E. Clark's son, Undertakers, the business of his grandfather, Edward Clark, Jr. Edith married Abram Griffin. It is through the grandchildren of Edith that we still have a link to Wales. In 2002, Nalene Fabricius Hansi, great-granddaughter of Amos and Anne, visited Wales and met Meyer and Elizabeth, granddaughters of Edith and great-granddaughters of Edward, brother to Amos. After Nalene arrived home, she received a package from them. It contained the Bible that belonged to Anne Jarvis Clark, mother of Amos Clark. The Bible is very frail and worn from use. It is in Welsh. It reminds us that for many generations the scriptures have been important in our heritage. Meyer and Elizabeth said that the Welsh descendant had the Bible for 150 years and that they thought now the American cousins should have it. Our Welsh cousins are Enid, Meyer, Elizabeth, and Erwin. Taken in 2008, this picture shows the four remaining grandchildren of Edith and Abraham. Another Welsh contact was with Edward's other daughter, Bertha. Thanks to Bertha, we learned about the Clark family that remained in Wales. She greeted visitors from the American cousins when they visited Wales and often wrote to Vela Clark Jones and gave the news from relatives in Wales for the Clark family newsletter that Vela wrote for several years. Vela is a granddaughter of Amos and Anne Clark. Many excerpts from this documentary come from Vela. This was background on Amos' side of the family. Now let's consider Amos's wife Anne Johnstone Clark's heritage. Although Anne was born in Ross, many of her family members were born in Ruhaven, which is two or three miles south of Ross. Anne's father was Richard Handel Johnstone. In the 1851 census, Anne's father Richard was listed as a coal miner, but we think that he changed professions, as in his will just two years later, he was listed as a shopkeeper. The grandparents of Anne's father, Richard Johnstone, are still unproven, 
Richard's father was George, and we know that his death date was June 3rd, 1828. But we are puzzled about his birth information. There is a tradition that a baronet came from Scotland and married a Welsh girl, and he and his descendants stayed in Wales. George, son of Amos and Anne, stated that the baronet Johnston, who had lived in Scotland, had been disinherited and the estate had gone into the chancery. All of this is unproven for the time being. However, we do know from the research of Shirley Larson Nielsen, great-granddaughter of Amos and Anne Clark, that George Johnstone and Anne were married in Liverpool, and then moved to Wales. It is thought that the name Johnstone came from Scotland, but then changed to Johnson later on in Wales. George and Anne Johnstone are the grandparents of Anne Johnstone that married Amos Clark. Anne's father, Richard Handel Johnstone, married Anne Thomas, her mother, in 1830. They had three children, Anne, George, and David. Her mother, Anne Thomas, died in July 1836 when Anne was four years old. Her mother's sister, Sarah, came to take care of the children. There was Anne and her brother George left after the little brother, David, died in September of 1836 at about the age of ten months. Sarah Thomas and Richard Johnstone were married in 1837. They were married at the parish church of Wrexham. After her mother's death, Anne Johnston spent much of her time with her grandmother, Elizabeth Pritchard Thomas, and helped her with housework. George was the brother of Anne and the grandfather of Sephora Jones Clark, who later married Anne's son, George Clark. George Johnson worked as a horseman, a forgeman, an iron puddler, and a coal miner, and lived in different towns in the surrounding area of Ross. It is interesting that George is found in the census records under the name of Johnson instead of Johnstone. Sarah Tunna was the wife of George Johnson. George and Sarah had six children and raised their family in Ross. Their daughter, Anne Jones, is the mother of Sephora. This is the tombstone for George Johnson. He is buried in Gresford, Wales. Gresford is about four miles north of Rose. Even before the death of her father, Richard, Anne went to live with her uncle, Robert Thomas. Her grandmother, Elizabeth Pritchard, was also living in the home. Pictured are Mary and Zipporah Thomas, Anne's cousins. In the 1851 census, Ann Johnstone is listed as being an 18-year-old servant living in the home of Robert Thomas, age 40. Robert is a brother to Ann's mother. He was a shopkeeper. It is the family tradition that Amos and Ann met at her uncle's store where she clerked. Amos and Ann both lived in Rose, Denbyshire, Wales, where they were born and had lived most of their lives. The homes were built closely together and the streets were very narrow. The climate was livable and enjoyable, except in the winter months, when their small coal and wood stoves and fireplaces were not adequate to stave off the cold winds and freezing weather. The summers, springs, and falls had enough rainfall to keep the countryside very green and lush most of the time. It was beautiful in May and June. These are some scenes in the village of Rose taken in 1904. Ponky is the section of Rose where Amos was born in 1833. Amos's musical education began at an early age when he was a boy and he spent his evenings with friends who were able to instruct him in the rudiments of music. The family all loved music and had good voices. So true to their Welsh heritage, they spent much of their leisure time singing and studying music. Groups of young people would get together and try to compose songs, especially religious ones. Amos was a good singer and was always ready to learn from his musically educated friends. He spent much time copying new songs and music. Today, Rose is still renowned for its rich musical heritage. It is the home of several choirs, including the Rose Male Voice Choir. This choir is known throughout the world, touring and consistently enjoying success at a national and international levels in our day. This rich musical heritage is very evident in the life of Amos Clark. Amos attended school every chance he had because he was quick, learned readily, and enjoyed it. He was a good scholar. He started to school when he was quite young. He had to pay six cents a week, which was considered a large price in those days. 
It did come down to two cents for a time, and the students paid that amount until school was free. The first schoolhouse he attended was no larger than a dwelling house. It had long benches for the students to sit on. They had to write on slates. The children had to buy their own books, if they had any. Amos walked three and one-half miles to school. If he was late, he would have to hold out his hand while his teacher hit it with a rod. The next school building was a hall, a large building. He had seven different teachers in all. These are different views of the church in Ruhaben. It is still standing today, but because of the drop in attendance, it is a shared church now. The Roman Catholic Church and the Anglican Church in Wales currently use the same building. At first, the people of the British Isles were forced to attend the Anglican Church, but by the 1800s many of them had gone to the dissenter churches. One such dissenter church was the Campbellite Baptists. The Campbellite Baptists were a Protestant denomination that developed from several religious movements in the United States during the early 1800s. Its founders included three men of Presbyterian background, one of which was Thomas Campbell. The Church observes two ordinances, Communion, or the Lord's Supper, and Baptism. Communion was observed every Sunday. They observed baptism for adult believers to fulfill the requirements of a personal decision to follow Christ. Edward Clark, Amos's father, was a very devout church member, belonging to the Wesleyan Church. At the time Amos was born, there was a great religious unrest in Wales and England. People felt that various principles of some of the churches were wrong. Religion was always a topic of discussion in the Clark home. Amos was brought up in the Wesleyan Church, but early in life he felt that infant baptism and sprinkling was without biblical authority and that immersion alone was scriptural baptism. So he joined the Church of Christ, Campbellite Baptists, who baptized three times, once in the name of the Father, once in the name of the Son, and once in the name of the Holy Ghost, immersing the person face downward instead of backwards as is done by the Latter-day Saints. Amos's wife, Anne, was brought up as a strict Wesleyan also. Her marriage to a Campbellite was very much opposed by her family, but since Amos was a devout Christian, they finally gave their consent. Anne's father, Richard Johnstone, died in June of 1853. Amos and Anne were married on the 13th of November in 1853 in the St. Mary's Church in Rabin. He was 20 years old and she was 21. The church in Rabin is a beautiful place with ornate stained glass windows on both sides of the building. The aisle in the center was wide with pews on both sides. The light coming through the stained glass directly behind the pulpit threw a beautiful light and colors all through the church. After their marriage, Amos continued to work with his father in the blacksmith shop, and Anne, whose family owned a business, continued to help with the shop where she had worked before her marriage. Amos was still unsettled about his religious convictions, not believing in the principles of the church he belonged to, or any of the churches he had studied. He was hoping to find a religion that professed the same teachings that he believed were right. He studied the Bible continually, hoping to find a clue to the right church. When the Mormon missionaries came to North Wales, they left Amos Clark the message contained in The Voice of Warning by Orson Pratt, and the gospel in its fullness as contained in the Book of Mormon. Amos and Anne became earnest investigators. The elders were always welcome in their home, where they had many gospel conversations and cottage meetings. Some of the first missionaries were Captain Dan Jones of Provo, Elias Morris, and Thomas Jeremy of Salt Lake City. Amos was baptized February 28, 1855. As a good singer, he joined with the elders in doing missionary work. He was very zealous in defending and expounding the gospel wherever possible. His sister, Miriam Clark, also joined the church to the dismay of the Edward and Anne Clark family. The family of Amos and Anne grew. Moses was born September 6, 1854. Anne was born in 1856. Elizabeth was born in 1858. Sarah was born in 1861. And Mary was born in 1863. So, before immigrating to America, the family consisted of one son and four daughters. <laughs>
During this time, their family was criticized by their families and friends because they belonged to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Amos actively supported his church whenever he had the opportunity. This brought opposition from his family and his wife's family. The rift between them widened. Amos and Anne had thought of going to Utah like Amos' sister Miriam had done. As their criticism and antagonism increased towards them and the church, they decided to immigrate to Utah. The family was strongly opposed to them leaving Wales. Anne's family told her, If he wants to go to Salt Lake City, let him go. We will take care of the children, and you can come back and work in the store. However, she had a desire also to join with the saints. They continued quietly making preparations for their departure. On April 18, 1866, they sent their things to Liverpool. However, when they were ready to start, their relatives had hidden two of the children. Elizabeth was one of the children that could not be found. This information was sent to Liverpool and the boat was held over until the next day. The neighborhood was all excited over the affair. A cousin named John Moses saw the unpleasant situation they were in and came to the rescue, finding the children and helping them to Liverpool. John Moses was Anne's cousin. He was 26 years old at the time. They came to New York City on the sailing vessel the John Bright after a rough voyage of 37 days. They left Liverpool on April 30, 1866, with Captain W. L. Dawson as master of the ship. Aboard were some 747 Mormon emigrants, led by Elder Collins M. Gillett, a returning missionary from England. During the passage there were no deaths and only one storm. They had to provide and prepare their own food while on the boat. Amos Clark had quite a task for caring for a sick wife and cooking something for the children. Ann Johnstone Clark had a miscarriage while on the boat and was very ill. Hard bread and sea biscuits were very coarse and heavy for her. Anne was so sick that it seemed she would not recover. However, with the administration of the elders and through the faith and prayer of the saints, she got better and lived to bear her testimony of the blessings of the Lord in her behalf. Jonas N. Beck from Newton, Utah, was one of the elders on the boat who helped administer to her. Later they met again in Utah. They landed at Castle Gardens, New York. Castle Gardens was located on the southwest tip of Manhattan, in Battery Park. It was an immigrant processing center. They went by train to St. Louis, Missouri. From there, they sailed on a small steamer up the Missouri River to St. Joseph, Missouri. While on this boat, Amos received a testimony of the promptings of the Spirit. He was reaching over the edge of the boat with a bucket on a rope, and the force of the current caused him to lose his balance. The voice said, Let go of the rope, which he did, saving himself from a plunge and a possible drowning in the muddy water. The Clark family began outfitting for the trek west at Wyoming, Nebraska, which is on the west bank of the Missouri River, about 40 miles south of Omaha. They departed July 10, 1866, with 230 individuals in 46 wagons. They arrived September 5, 1866. The captain of the wagon train was Samuel D. White. At the time they crossed the plains, Amos was listed as 33, Anne was 34, Moses was 12, Anne was 10, Elizabeth was 7, Sarah Angeline 5, and Mary Carolyn was 3. These were the words of Amos Clark himself as he described his journey west. The way me and Grandma crossed the plains with five children. After traveling from New York, part on a river, then on a train, again on a river called the Missouri River, unto a place called Wyoming. At the place, we stayed about two weeks to wait for the teams to come and meet us and to prepare for the journey. Some of the people had tents to sleep in. Also, there were some old buildings to stay in. We had the chance to get in a building, something like a big barn. We were glad to get inside of a building because it rained heavy sometimes. After being in that place about two weeks, we started on our journey westward. There was a large company of people. There were over 700 Mormon people on the ship John Bright. They traveled on the sea for five weeks, and it was supposed that there were that many crossing the plains in companies. There were about 30 wagons in each company. Oxen pulled most of the wagons. There were two mule teams with a few horses mixed. We had horses pulling our wagon. We had to cross one big river called the Platte River. 
I had to walk through the river. It was a big, wide river. It took all day for all the teams to cross the river. Our teamster got sick on the way, and I had to drive the team until he got well. I had to drive up high hills and down. We stopped to camp every night in a circle fashion. We made fires and had a supper, and after supper I had a short meeting, singing and praying, and a little talking. Then the older people could go to bed, and the young people enjoyed themselves in dancing and fun. There was one man who got lost on the way. He went hunting with his gun, but he never came back. They stopped the train in one place for a whole day to try and find him. At night we made big fires for him to see, but never found him. The men had been told not to go from the side of the train. The journey across the plains was a long, tedious, and tiresome journey, and we were very glad when we reached the end of the journey after traveling eight weeks. When we were drawing towards Utah, some kind friends came to meet us, and they brought some potatoes. We can't hardly tell you how good they tasted. From other sources, we were able to glean a few more details of the journey. Celestia Bromley wrote about the trip. Robert Daybell was lost and never found nor heard of. The men went out to hunt for him. The train stopped over, but the Indians were bad. They had burnt the stage wagon station, horses, and some telegraph poles. Captain White said we must go on, so the children and the old people rode in the wagons. Every man took his gun and walked on the right side of the wagons. I drove the team. The teamster had his gun ready to shoot if the signal was given. There were about 50 Indians. They would come almost to the train, make a circle with their horses, then get under the horses and point their arrows at us. That night when we camped, the Indians came to the campfire. The captain gave them bacon and other things. They smoked the pipe of peace. The next morning we went on our journey unmolested. Amos did not enjoy working with animals, and therefore hired a teamster to drive them across the plains. His name was Orange Horatio Warner. He was about 19 years old at the time. No wonder Amos wrote that they were very glad to reach the end of the journey. In spite of the wilds of the American frontier, both Amos and Anne had a strong desire to gather to a place where they could worship with other saints who believed the same as they did. They kept that vision of building Zion in their hearts and endured the hardships and trials related to travel at that time. Thank you.